and welcome to Imposter Hour with Liz and Greg. We are here to explore the imposter syndrome that haunts creatives, delving into how it affects their lives and work. Join us as we chat with authors and artists about creativity, self-doubt, and featuring imposter characters in their stories, as well as the occasional imposter who pops up in their day-to-day lives. Let's geek out on all things that fuel and challenge the most talented minds. Today, we are very excited to have Lee Matthew Goldberg on, on the show. Lee is the Anthony Lefty and Prix de Pilar nominated author of 14 novels, count them 14, including The Ancestor, The Mentor, and The Great Gimmelmans, as well as the five-book Desire Card series. His YA series, Runaway Train, is currently being developed with actress, actress Regan Revord from Young Sheldon Attached. He graduated with an MFA from the New School and has been published in multiple languages. His writing has appeared in Crime Reads, Pipeline Artists, Lit Hub, Chicago Quarterly Review, and many other outlets. His pilots and screenplays have been finalists in Script Pipeline, Book Pipeline, and numerous other screenwriting competitions. He is the co-author of the Gorilla Lit Reading Series and lives in New York City. Lee, welcome to the show. And I'd like to say um, right off the bat, uh, stop being so lazy. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me, Liz and Greg. Um, yeah, I'm not lazy. I'm a bunch of other things, but I'm definitely not lazy. And um, I like to write, you know, that's yeah. it's my passion. Clearly. Yeah. And you're no, prolific. You I mean, I kind of think you don't qualify to be on this show, but you're going to have to prove yourself for the next hour. Oh, so. I, I, I have my own imposter issues all the time. I just try to push through it as much as possible, which I think is the best thing you can do as a creative. Um, and ignore all the noise and just focus. And, you know, I write most days in Central Park in nature, and I feel like that's my best outlet to, like, avoid everything and just focus on what I need to focus on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have to say, you and I met in person recently at Thriller Fest, Mm -hmm. and at dinner you were talking about how you have one tree in Central Park, which obviously we don't give the location, but I think no. that is so amazing. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that process and how you found that tree. Sure. I mean, I'm a native New Yorker, so Central Park has always been a part of my life, a huge part of my life. Um, and I would say it was about f- almost 15 years ago. Um, I was just in the park. I wanted to write. And I don't know, this tree like kind of gave me like a wink. Like it was like kind of come on over. Um, and I really I've written like all my books under it, it perfectly fits my back. So it just has a nice like kind of swoop that my back contours to. Um, and a good mix of kind of sun and shade. And it's a little bit away from the big kind of buzz of Central Park. So it's it's almost like a little bit of a hidden location that not too many people could find. There's a bathroom close by, there's a hot dog cart with water. So it it, it, it almost was just like made for me, even though I know it's not technically my tree. And you managed to it's not... It's like a Nora Ephron. You've got tree. It's like a... It, yes. <laughs> oh, my God. I, let's let's make that development happen. I would totally... Yeah. It, it's a real <laughs> love story rom-com between me and the tree. And, like, there was a moment, actually, this was, like, over COVID, where I, I, I hadn't been to it in a long time. And I went to it, and I just had this urge to give it, like, this giant hug there's a picture of me with the mask hugging the tree so it it, it you know I, I couldn't ask for for a better reading partner in life <laughs> and you and you and you not entirely like literally year round but I mean you you extend that season pretty as much as you possibly can oh yeah 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 I, I'm you nuts like year. I'll yeah I, I mean I would say April to November is kind of the norm, but I'll extend it as much as possible. And if, yeah. which honestly, this last winter there was, there was like a couple of days where it was in the forties. If it's like mid forties, I can handle it for the day. And I'll like go to my tree. Um, anything less than that would kind of be uncomfortable. You know, I'll be in like an, uh, like an overcoat and everything. Um, but yeah, my writing just kicks ass so much more when I'm outside than in my yeah. apartment. Yeah, And then I'll go to the main library, the Ghostbusters library on 42nd Street, mm-hmm. kind of sometimes during the winter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's great. You, you so have to a- have a plan B. <laughs> I have to have a plan B. Yeah. Although, and I don't know if you've ever been to Rose Main Reading Room, but it's a wonderful spot. And sometimes you'll see like an MSNBC talking head working. So it's mm-hmm. a lot of creatives and the energy you feel there actually, I think, also helps my writing. Yeah. yeah. 
So it sounds like you figured out a way in spite of the imposter syndrome to kind of use, use either nature or a routine to center you in your writing practice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, New York is such a place where I think imposter syndrome can happen because there's so many people doing like so many amazing things on such another level. And yeah. sometimes you feel like you're not enough here that you're, you know, like, you know, crap in the bed a little bit in terms of New York City. Um, so I had to find a way to kind of remove New York sometimes from my writing space. And even though Central Park couldn't be more New York, it also is a way of having an access outside of it. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I have the least amount of imposter syndrome, I will say, when I'm in nature. And I get to, I don't know if you both feel this way too, but like I leave my body most of the time and... Mm. I know where I go, but I go somewhere and then there's a chapter like it, it kind of just happens magically or universe universally. Yeah. Amazing. It's, that, it's that flow state that we're always all looking for. In the yeah. Corner. And I think, I think that's when you really hit the best work is when yeah. you're able to kind of, because you know, you have all the life stuff that kind of sometimes takes over the writing. And when you're just able to purely go into the story, um, that's when I really feel like it it, it sings on a different level. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Um, to go back for a quick second, you were you make a sure. a very valid point of you know being in a city like New York where there are all of these creatives and they're all kind of doing mm -hmm. you know, some version of what you're doing. But in your case, uh, there's actually an extra level to this in that you are one of two. Lee Goldbergs, who are <laughs> authors. So you also yeah. have like a little bit, of, we're, we're already coming in with a, a little bit of a-, a Yeah, a oh my God. I, I didn't even think of that, but yes, totally. Like I had imposter syndrome starting my career because Lee Goldberg was well-established. I began my career about 10, 11 years ago um, mm -hmm. and I had to use a different name. So I had to use my full name with my middle name. Otherwise it would get really confusing and it still is completely confusing <laughs> for for everybody. I, I feel like we're getting to a point where like in the industry, everybody knows, but there's like that fan that's like, did you write the Monk series? And it's like, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, I, I have imposter syndrome related to that. And it makes me also potentially, I, I was telling you about this sort of when we had lunch, Greg, but that I want to potentially do uh, a series under a pen name so I could really be removed completely from that connection um, and just have a minute off from it. Yeah, sure. Right. Well, I, I relate. Even though he's great. Yeah. I relate, Lee. Uh, there's another Elizabeth Keenan who is a young adult. Oh. Writer who mm -hmm. people often mistake me for her when I'm in person. And I've had a lot of people come up and say how much they loved my book and then it's her book. And <laughs> I, I do not assume her identity, um, but right, really right. have her on the show. And yes. Oh I, yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. I've signed, of I've signed copies for Lee Goldberg a billion times <laughs> because <laughs> sometimes it's just easier you know, and I think he's done that like once for me, maybe <laughs> just because, he, yeah, he's a bigger author than me. So he has more fans and stuff. Right. Um, but he's also become a good friend throughout this. I mean, you know, like you have to kind of laugh at it. Um, and it's it's like an in joke. We'll be in each other's lives forever, basically. Right. Yeah. Um, yes. So it, it, he, he has a good sense of humor about it. Definitely. We should get a literary name twins like series going where we just get all there's a few together. others, yeah, yeah. There's there's a few others, and I think it's when you know there, there's a weatherman as a New Yorker. I'm sure you've seen Lee Goldberg on ABC News, mm -hmm. so sure. you know it's not the most uncommon name that right there right. would be a chance. The fact that we both write crime and thrillers, you know, that's a little strange, but yeah. That's interesting. But you guys could always do you you guys could co-author a project together as you know. Yeah. You think? I don't know. I feel like that would like the time space continuum would explode would if sh that happened. It would, it would shatter, but I mean it might be It would amazing. just shatter. Yeah. Because one time I was like I kind of wanted to ask him for a blurb and we both were like <laughs> no that's not going to make Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to make any sense. People would be so like WTF like <laughs> yeah. this guy is so um, arrogant he's blurbing himself yes exactly <laughs> yeah. yes yeah, yeah yeah I feel like that's what would happen 
Um, so that's well. that's been avoided. Yeah. Yep. Meanwhile, Liz, you could do uh, your your doppelganger is YA, so you guys could make some sort of unholy concoction together. Yeah. Mm. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. That could be an interesting hybrid. No, I'm I'm excited to connect with her and see what kind of uh, scam we can come up with, and yeah. just you know the next JT Leroy, you know, yeah. right? Like yeah, 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 or or better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> better than that. Better, <laughs> better than that, definitely. But we're about due for a new one. I think we need a new high profile. Yeah, yeah, scam, yeah. Right. We're due. I'm always into that. Yeah, I mean yeah. because it's. You know, the news is so insane and troubling and depressed. So when it's like a literary scandal, it's yes. light. You know, it, it it was like the Lori Loughlin from Full House when there was like that scandal with the college oh, yeah. stuff. It's like a light, you know, light news. <laughs> right. A little palate cleanser. He's, yeah. A little palate cleanser between like, you know, the Supreme Court and everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a great... Lori Laughlin is a great segue to we were talking imposter. about nostalgia. Yeah. Yes, well, mm -hmm. imposter for sure. And then also, you know, in in the Great Gimmelmans, you are, your setting is 1980s, shortly after mm -hmm. the stock market crash. You know, I yes. was born in 1978. Greg, you were me too. Well. Me too. Yeah. So yep. we're, we're like oh, we're all 78. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So your your whole novel was just like speaking the language of like core awesome. memories, and yeah. mm -hmm. um, I, so many great references and incredible. How Thank you. you. Take references that you know I think are probably considered pretty fluffy. You know, Tiffany, Debbie Gibson, mm -hmm. Garbage Pail mm -hmm. Kids, on and on, and you intertwine with like really heavy material. You know, and that yeah, levity yeah. is is brilliant the balance of oh that thank you so well yeah originally yeah. the book was going to take place in the 1930s it was going to be a very serious book about a different stock market crash and bank robbers kind of getting out of that and then COVID hit and i just didn't feel like writing about something depressing and you know like you said i was born in 78 i'm pretty much the same age as aaron was the book takes place in like 88 89 so like i was 10 and 11 around that time and 80s music, I don't know, the 80s were just like fun. It was like, the music was crazy. Everybody was on cocaine. So like, it just kind of fit with the book really well. Um, and I think became also a, a really important outlet for me to take me away from what was happening at the time. So the, the, the you know, the, the book was sort of a saving grace in that way. And I think that was always the book that was meant to happen. It was never meant to be like a serious, like road to perdition kind of, you know, novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it is a road to per perdition just in an RV with a zany cast of. Uh, yes. You know, yeah. Family yeah. Characters. Yeah. But yeah. We pitched it like Little Miss Sunshine meets the Coen brothers. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Which, perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Nailed it. <laughs> but, but to Liz's point, the specificity of some of those references, and I, it helps that we all grew up, you know, as we just mentioned in the same year and have that same frame of reference. But Liz mm -hmm. and I were saying, it's amazing how evocative those things are. And your specificity of detail helps that along because suddenly, you know, oh, you're thanks. reading one of those. And especially if you're of that era and you grew up and you have those uh, mm -hmm. references, you know, in your shorthand, it's just like, oh man, okay, I remember that. We were saying that the, the way you, even the way you use the Garbage Pail Kids in sort of the like meet cute, you know, with the crush, mm -hmm. even like the way you do yes, that is yes, cool. yeah, yeah. The you, there's such a thing about that of like that somehow being part of the um the romance that blossoms. Yeah. You know, it's the just the like, 80s. So I think the 80s were really one of the very first times where like children were marketable and they were really catered to in terms of like toys and everything. So like yeah. it was like a feast of kings for us. It was like there's mm -hmm. so many things, and I would go to um you know, like the corner store and just buy garbage pail kids all the time. And my, my mom always tells the story where um, one night I stayed up all night and I took them all off and I stuck them all over the walls of my bedroom. And she like opened the door and was like, what did you do? And we couldn't scrape them off. They like, so it was just like that forever until it was like finally redone like years later. Um, so it was just such a like cultural point of my childhood. And they were fun, like the book. They were like a little zany and crazy and gross and weird. And, um, you know, that was kind of the, the vibe I was going for. 
Yeah. 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 Well, and they predated, you know, political correctness. They would never yes. hold up. In this yeah. Situation. Yeah. There's definitely some of them that would be a, a big no. Um, right. And I know that there's a few that go for like thousands on eBay right now. Like there there's people? certain ones. Yeah. That on another level, like, you know, like a Mickey Mantle baseball card or something. Right. Wow. Oh. And yet they're just disgusting. Disgusting. <laughs> like they're just disgusting cartoons for, for children. I, lo- I just love that just proves that there really is a market for everything. Um, <laughs> Completely. Speaking, speaking of markets, perhaps you could, this might be a good segue for you to just give our, we've, we've sung your praises on the book itself, but if you want to just give our, uh, <laughs> if, if you want to give our, our listeners just a little bit of a, uh, maybe, uh, you know, a thumbnail on what the great Gimmelman's how that kind of goes sure down. it is a rollicking zany story thank you so the great gimelman takes place in right after the stock market crash in 1987 and it's about a family the father barry loses um, his job and they lose all their money in the crash and instead of being like normal citizens they hop in the only thing that's not repossessed by the government the family's like shit rv and start robbing banks and they're like really 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 good at it little kids and all and they become, in this fictional world, the most successful, you know, bank robbers of the era until the wheels start to fall off the RV and the feds and the mob, you know, it's kind of come out after them. But right. they, you know, even in between robbing banks, they have time to go to like a Tiffany and Debbie Gibson concert at a mall. And um, it, it also helps them, I think, for a moment at least, bond together as a family where they weren't able to do that um before the kids really start to realize they need out of this family yeah Yeah. but it also doubles in a in again it's a it's this really kind of zany wonderful comedy but it also does double as this um kind of indictment of capitalism as well which is interesting yeah completely completely and it's it's interesting Um, as a book to write now because we are seeing that kind of mirror effect happening again so yeah that's yeah yeah i mean barry is a character has kind of like a almost a little bit Donald Trump vibe and that he like does whatever he wants, thinks he can get away with it. Right. Doesn't care the consequences. Um, so, I mean, I think any historical book and it's crazy that 1989 is historical, but this right. is the world, this is the reality. Um, you know, I think it has to mirror somewhat to society today for it to, you know, have a point almost and not just be nostalgic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of the things when I was reading your book, Lee, um, I like to play a game in my head when I'm reading, like if this book could be related to another book, like almost in a similar universe. And here's my shameless plug for the episode, but Trust Issues, okay. our next book is about a con artist family, essentially. Um, mm-hmm. Strange. But, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that I loved that you did so effectively in The Great Gemmelman's that I think Greg and I aspired and hopefully succeeded in some respects was showing the humanity of criminals and kind of the the origin stories, the um, motivations, you know, in, in your case your main character, he he's motivated by money, obviously, and the, mm-hmm. the stock market is kind of the catalyzing event. But what was so brilliant, I thought, um, and I think what we really tried to do was to show how family dynamic plays into mm-hmm. the decision making, mm-hmm. even at like mm-hmm. the kind of height of a crime. <laughs> you know? And um, and the sibling rivalry sibling dynamic is something that we wrote a lot about. So do you want to awesome. talk about kind of the amateur or the imposter characters within your family dynamic? Sure. Um, So, yeah, I mean, on, uh, you know, on one hand, I think, you know, writing crime fiction, writing thrillers, it's so important to have empathy for your characters, even if they're like a serial killer. It's like everybody came from a certain place and made them who they are. Um, So that was something I really, really wanted to do um, as much as possible. you know, with the sib with the siblings, um, am I it, like froze for a second or and like rock solid about the book? And regardless of like all the imposters around them, and the parents are like the biggest imposters. I mean, they're really solely in it for themselves and the money, and the kids are sort of like you know a side thought. Um, that even in the midst of all these imposters that they're dealing with, that they the three of them as a core 
really stay true to each other, even though they couldn't be more wildly different and they kind of hate each other, but that mm-hmm. there's this love and there's this scene kind of towards the end where they like all hug each other. Um, or even in the beginning when um, Aaron thinks the other two got caught by the police, um, that, that they always are able to stay somewhat normal because they have each other to kind of lean on throughout this insanity kind of all of around them. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, even as a writer, that's important too. Like, you know, regardless of whatever imposter syndrome you feel, you know, to stay true to yourself. And if you have other people in your life that can kind of support you in this as well, that believe in your career and that are able to kind of take you through the hardest times and help you kind of, you know, remove yourself from it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah I like that. I like that's that. really insightful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So Craig, you looked like you were going to ask a question. I didn't want to jump over you. Oh, no, no, not at all. Um, no, I was just, I was, so I was thinking a bit also about, um, you had said before that you are, you know, you, you have this idea that of writing uh, under a pen name as well as an alias. And I was mm-hmm. wondering, is that something, remind me, I know that we had talked about this at one point, but is that some, is that currently in the works? Is that happening? Are you like, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually also writing a con artist book right now too. It takes place in the Hamptons. Um, and I was just there doing research, research last (laughs) week. Um, it's it's a really ridiculous fun book and some of my other books, even though the Gilman's is quite fun. A lot of my other ones are a little more serious and very dark. Um, so my thought was like, what if I wanted to write these kind of like fun beach thrillers? Um, would it make sense to do that under a pen name? So I'm writing it in my head under a pen name, and then we'll see once it's finished sort of the smartest avenue for it. But regardless, whether it might be like a sci-fi book in the future or maybe, you know, veering towards my YA stuff, um, something I want to do under a pen name because I'm prolific and in publishing, it's really hard to get multiple books published at the same time. And I feel like this would help that if I have two different avenues with two clear different names, obviously. Um, and I love my pen name. My pen name is going to be Sawyer Shark. So I really want to. I really want to create Sawyer Shark because I think he'd be a lot of fun. I love oh, that. I love it! It's a so great you... character name too. Yeah, and Sawyer Shark is—he's ridiculous. I mean, he is a ridiculous person. So, and it's helped me write this. Like, I. I, I'm a different person writing it and, and that's been great. That was so going to be, I might, I mean, I'm an imposter. I'm an imposter <laughs> writing it. Well, that was going to be my follow-up question. There's a little bit of a mm-hmm. meta aspect to the fact that you're writing about yes. an imposter yeah. character as an imposter author in a sense. Yep. Yeah. So yep. that's kind yeah. of funny. So, so that has, you'd say that that's opened up kind of different avenues oh. in terms of your, your, Oh, creative. it's been amazing. Oh. Yeah, there's it has been so much freedom writing this book because it's almost like, you know, like I don't give a fuck. Like, you know, like it, it I kind of just do whatever I want with it. Um, right. where right. I, I felt constrained under a Lee Matthew Goldberg book a little bit, you know, like this is sort of the kind of books I write, even though they're so kind of all over the place. Um where yeah, and I've written it really fast. Like I'm about hundred and fifty pages in. I think it's been like a month and a half. Wow. What? Oh, you're ripping. Yeah. So okay. I'm ripping, ripping through this. Yeah. I need to open a new tab in this conversation. How many words are you getting on the page a day? Yeah. I'm, I get about five pages a day. Okay. Nice. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's great. About, about five pages a day and it's short chapters. So I usually aim to write a chapter a day. I'll edit that chapter first the next day. And then in the afternoon, write the other one. Um, and pretty much five days a week. Um, I think it's helped that it's summer. The book takes place in the summer. Um, I'm going back to the Hamptons in a couple of weeks to do some more research. Um, but it actually really helped. Like it, it, yeah. it, like I, yeah, being there for a week, like all these ideas came and it really changed some of the course of the later parts of the novel. Sure. No, I think um, that's really important to immerse yourself mm-hmm much as possible in the setting. I mean, books have been written by authors about places they've never been to that, and that's an incredible thing to pull off. Yeah. You know, I think there's a particular specificity that you can only get if you're sitting in the place, seeing the people, eating the food, hearing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Especially it's two and a half hours away. So it's like, it's an easy one to do the research for. 
and it's summertime and i i usually go for like a week or so in the summer anyway so it, it, it's nothing out of my normalcy um and it's fantastic and it, it takes place in southampton and southampton's ridiculous and so it fits along with the book really really well in terms of like what i wanted for it um and that one I'm pitching is the fair meets clue with like a little bit of Melrose place. Oh my mm. God. Yeah. I love Just these checked comps. all my boxes. Sign me up. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the working title, because it's about these con artists that um, are being blackmailed and try to kill this person. And they're just like completely inept and the person does not die. So the working title is just die already. <laughs> so you so so you got a so you got a little touch of blood simple in there as well which is yeah. great yeah. yeah i mean i actually feel like a lot of the Coen brothers kind of you know mm -hmm. like sprinkles onto a lot of my books um sure. because i think they do crime and humor really well um and there's yeah. always that balance where you sometimes don't know whether to laugh or to like you know be in shock um, and I, I like to think that's kind of what I go for with a lot of my work that, you know, you're, you're, you're laughing to mask the, the, the insanity of it almost. Yes. Right. Well, that brings up a good point as well. As we mentioned, you know, you're very prolific. You have a number of different, uh, genres and things going on. So you have, I mean, I imagine that you're drawing just in your, in your actual writing, you're drawing from a pretty wide skill set. Do you find in a practical sense, let's say if you're doing something, you know, how, how does, for instance, adult fiction stack up against YA? How does, sure. you know, like, like, like the, you're, you're, you're hitting so many kind of different mm -hmm. kinds of beats or se um, seemingly different kinds of beats yeah, how does that kind of, you know, how does that work for you, let's say project to project or even sometimes even yeah. the same project if you're going for a tonal shift, you know? I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of twofold. Like in one way, writing in different genres, they become palette cleansers and I write okay. screenplays as well. So that's also like a great palette cleanser for me um, to write two very intense thrillers kind of back to back. Like my last one took place in, I actually wrote a 1930s book that deals with like Nazis. It's very, very serious. It took a lot out of me to write. So like, I can't do that again right away. Um, and that one was written in like the winter. You know, I, 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 I feel like certain seasons writing books work better for me versus other ones. Um, and a lot, like I started, I wrote my YA series just because I wanted to challenge myself. I yeah. love grunge music. I am a huge, I mean, we talked about, you know, born in 1978. So we were you know, full teenagers and the explosion of like Pearl Jam and Nirvana and Hole and everything. And I really wanted to write a, a, a series. Runaway Train was one of my favorite songs. And I, mm -hmm. it just inspired this whole book series about this girl who, you know, is dealing with um, a rough family situation, a sister that dies, and she wants to run away from home to become a grunge singer like her idol, Kurt Cobain, and meet him. And the band actually becomes successful. And it's almost like a it charts the ups and down of, of, of her career. Um, and you know, it's, it's written in the voice of a 16 year old girl. I am not. Um, but I, I, I want to challenge myself, you know, like, I feel like that's like sometimes the best thing you could do as a writer is to like, and to going back to like imposter syndrome, sometimes get you out of that imposter syndrome by like doing something so out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Um, and, I'm really glad I did it. And at first I thought maybe I would get some blowback and like it has not happened. Um, so that's been good. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we have a cool actress attached to it and, you know, that's we're amazing. hoping to sell it, you know, to, to a producer. Why is it tough sell right now in Hollywood? So, you know, it, it might not be at this moment, but um, you know, the actress is just the loveliest person and she's so committed to the project and we've been working on it for like three years so wow. it's, it's been a lot yeah yeah i've kind of like seen her grow up through it um and her love for it was like oh it's not about social media it's it, it's about this time that seemed very innocent before that and mm. where music meant something kind of a little bit more because you had to like own the cd and the cd became a part of your world and the album cover and you know you listen to all the tracks and um so it, it, it just fit in a way that was very different than the 2020s. Mm -hmm. Right.
Interesting. Well, music is something I wanted to ask you about because I had heard an interview for another one of your books, The Ancestor, and that was inspired mm -hmm. by a song. Yes. It sounds like this mm -hmm. um, series was as well. Is that yes. your kind of inspiration well? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, The Ancestor, I, I love this band, Darling Side. They're an indie rock band. Um, and I listened to their song, The Ancestor, once, and like the whole book just came to me. I might have been on an edible. <laughs> <laughs> Performance and but, no judgment. But the whole, I literally the whole book came out to me and I reached out to Darling Side um, and told them. And I had a correspondence with the lead singer where I sent him the book and he was like so sweet about it. And he, you know, if you ever come to one of our concerts, please let me know. This was like 2020. So it was, you know, in a weird time. Um, yeah. But I, I just needed to let them know how that the book would not have existed without their band or that song. Um, and I, I really do find music, like even in the Gilliman's, like there's a full 80 soundtrack. You could yeah. find it on Spotify, like um, that, you know, really just brings you into it. And I've had younger people who were not alive during that time find the music a little bit through that. So like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to check out, you know, take me home tonight by eddie money or whatever other song is is a big part of it tiffany debbie gibson um so yeah music music is huge for me yeah now how does the music um obviously you write the music into a lot of your books how does yeah the music, how does the music actually uh interplay with your creative process are you listening to music as you're writing are you listening as a warm-up or as a cool down or how does that kind of yeah, it's 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 almost more like a warm up. Like I'll okay. if I listen to music while I'm writing, it's like the Legends of the Fall soundtrack. You know, it's like usually like yeah. classical, yeah. Braveheart yeah. soundtrack, Twin yeah. Peaks soundtrack. Like I have my kind of you know, or Segoros the band I'll listen to sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if it's full lyrics, it 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 messes with me too much. But like yeah. sometimes I'll do like a workout before I go write. So. For Gilman's, I was just like blasting 80s music and then like going to write every time. And I'd forgotten about a lot of these songs. Like I'd forgotten I yeah. had a huge crush on Tiffany growing up and Debbie Gibson and loved them. And, you know, like they kind of fell away. Um, yeah. So it, it was really special to kind of bring them back into um, like my purview. Well, I wonder too, specifically for that book with Gimmelman's, you wrote the, I feel like you got the voice of this adolescent kid down mm -hmm. so thoroughly and i wonder was that partly from immersing yourself you know we have such sense memory around music and especially with music that comes at that time when when you're um in those formative years because mm -hmm. you know, we've done these really interesting studies where music actually your brain is forming your neural pathways are forming and what ends up happening is the reason why now you can still you know um you can still recite all the lyrics from you know the songs that you that came out when you were like 13 mm -hmm. it actually form around the music itself oh wow so it i've always wondered that yeah so that's yeah the, there's, there's actual oh, brain science and so i was mm. wondering i was wondering for you kind of trying to get yourself <laughs> into that headspace of writing from this you know this kid's perspective is, is if mm -hmm. re-immersing yourself in the culture maybe was like a, a conduit to that in any way i think i that's fascinating and i've always wondered why i know like a billion exact lyrics like i know the whole like that song buffalo stance by nana cherry yeah. i know the yeah. entire lyrics like yeah. how do i remember that there's like a full rap section sure. and my brain like it popped up on my ipad the other day and like the whole thing i remembered so i i, I think you know listening to music and immersing myself like a hundred percent um i also had like my teacher around that time we had to like write journal entries every day and i mm. found all those journals um okay. and i like reread a lot of them and like the writing was pretty good <laughs> yeah. so I, that helped to like kind of get the voice and it, it had been sitting in my head like i don't know if, if you both work similarly but like a book sits in my head for about a year um, mm -hmm. so Aaron existed as a 1930s kid for a long time, maybe right. like two or three years in the back of my head. So then he kind of just morphed to like a 1989 kid instead where he was like a little sassier, um, and a little sure. sarcastic, but in all honesty, and I've told people this and they think it's a little strange, but like Aaron is the closest of all my characters 
to myself at that time. My parents were lovely and we didn't write rob banks, but like that was basically me when I was 11. Like I was a big smart ass yep. and I was sarcastic and like I was Aaron. So I, that made it easy to like, I just accessed, you know, 30 years ago, basically. Yeah. yeah. Keep back in. Right. So I know you mentioned changing the time from the 30s to the 80s mm -hmm. as kind of self-care because we were going through COVID. Were mm -hmm. there also any um, considerations when you were picking the time about pre-technology? You know, did yes. you want to have yeah. it pre-X technology for plug mm -hmm. reasons? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So in 1989, DNA was a very new thing to police work. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a lot easier to rob a bank. It's pretty impossible to rob a bank now. You can maybe rob like the littlest bank in the middle of nowhere, but you're going to get caught. Like, and there was no CCTV footage everywhere. Um, so it was almost the last moment before really we hit like internet and that starts to shift. Um, so when I was thinking about it, the, the book could not take place in 2024 in any way, shape or form. Uh, so it, 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 again, almost like was meant to be during that time. And I think that like every book is kind of cliche, but like every book goes on the journey, a book is meant to go on and wh whenever it takes place, however it takes place, however it's written, it was always meant to be that way. So it was never meant to be a 1930s book. Like it just needed to go through that process for then mm -hmm. it to become a 1988, 1989 book. Yeah. 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 It's hard sometimes to come to that conclusion when you've been living with a book for so long in your head, you know, yes. or that you have to change an entire character or a, we yeah. had to redo a whole act of a book, you know. It's, oh, really? Yeah. But once you do it, you realize, you know, or sure. the point of view. Yeah, I, I've done that before with one book where I turned it from, it, it was a young adult book from third to first person. And that was very time consuming. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, luckily I hadn't written anything yet. I think that would have really made it difficult to like accept to change. Um, right. and the characters kind of were all a little bit similar. I mean, the little girl was always a psychopath. She always <laughs> was like torturing animals. So she was doing that in the thirties. She was doing that in the eighties. Um, it's the parents were always, psychopaths. yeah, yeah. Right. It's timeless. The parents are always very lustful and like, fully into one another and in their own world. And um, I think the big sister maybe didn't fully exist in that other one. I, I trying to remember because she's so like pop obsessed and kind of boy mm -hmm. crazy. And yeah, so I, she might've been somebody else in the early version, um, but a lot of it stayed the same. And um, it always was going to be the great Gimmelman's because even in the thirties, it was like alluding to the great Gatsby. So mm -hmm. it was a play on those words anyway. So the yeah. title always, it was going to be the great Gilman something, something, something. And it, it just got shortened. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I, I like the idea of the thirties, but I'm very glad you put it in the eighties. Yeah. yeah, me too. Me too. They, again, the eighties are fun. They were yeah. you know, like, um, they're, yeah, they're, and the nostalgia, you know, um, and, and I like, I, I, I want to write another eighties book at some time when the time is right too. Maybe like early, I want to do like a New York, 80s book mm. at some point more, more yeah. my like little kid childhood yeah when i was reading gimmelman's i was thinking i want to rewatch wall street i want to revisit oh. you know bright lights big city you know yeah it's such a great time wall for books too fred easton Alice. wall street is, wall street is one of my favorite movies of all time i've seen it a billion times i love jay mcinerney and fred easton ellis i was reading them way too young yeah, but like too. they were they were the first when I was like 10, I want to say I read Bright Lights, Big City, where and I was kind of like, I want to do this. Like, <laughs> I didn't really know what it was about, maybe, but it, it, there was like an excitement to it. There was an um, energy. And I, yeah, and I, I read Brett Easton Ellis's latest book not too long ago, The Shards, and mm -hmm. it was one of the best books I've read in a long time. It was like oh. above and beyond amazing. Oh, no. He's awesome. Were, were the authors that we're talking about, were they uh, were they books that were around the house that you kind of stumbled upon or were these things that you were actively seeking out at that time? Were you a really precocious reader on your own? Yeah. 
Yeah, I was I was very precocious, and like my dad was a huge movie collector, so we had like every movie on VHS and Beta, and I was allowed to watch whatever I wanted whenever I wanted. So I was watching very R-rated films when I was like eight, nine, and okay. like Fatal Attraction, and like mm-hmm. all of like the '90s like erotic thrillers and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, yeah, like nothing was ever kept from me. And if I wanted a book, I got the book. Like, okay. it, 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 yeah, there was no parental advisory in any way, shape or form. Right. Um, or like Heather's, Heather's was like a huge movie for me when I was a kid. I yeah. would just go home some days if I was bored and just like watch it on loop, basically. So yeah. good. I wonder about thriller writers in our age group who were watching all of these movies. You know, I certainly watched our movies when before I should have, but you know, would I yeah. become the writer I am today had I not? Right. You know? I think about that sometimes. I, 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 movies during the era, and it's kind of similar to what you were saying before, Greg, about like music, you know, it's like those first like images that kind of stay in your brain. Um, and I just had such a love of movies. I still do that even more than books. I feel like I was influenced by, by film during that time. I was a big reader. Like I loved like Encyclopedia Brown when I was growing up and in the choose your own adventure series I, I, or like Henry and Ribsy, like things like that. Um, but I was, I was like obsessed with movies on another level. Yeah. So and as you mentioned, you are currently a screenwriter as well as a fiction writer. How do those, mm-hmm. how do those, um, we'll call them skill sets, uh, translate for you? Are those, is, is, is there kind of, you know, one, one, I don't know, you know, one pocket for one, another for another, do they sort of cross pollinate? Are there certain tricks, particular tricks you pick up for one that then apply to the other in interesting ways? Oh Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think all of that, I think they 100% cross pollinate. I think becoming a screenwriter has made me much better writer and like get to the point better, like less kind of like flowery prose. And I did an MFA and, you know, like kind of removing myself from that as much as possible. And like what I said before, they're palate cleansers. So I'll usually work on a script between books um, as a way of just kind of like a book is a lot more intensive. it's a lot more, you know, like work and headache and sweat and all of that. Um, but there is a skill set to writing a great screenplay that not every novelist is able to do. And you really have to follow a structure um, kind of more to a science. So it, it's it's almost like um, like a dessert chef versus a regular chef. Mm-hmm. That he, the, the math is involved a lot more with this with the screenplay. Um, and it's changing a little bit where you can kind of more do what you want. The difference is that like you can get a book published. You can't get a screenplay made unless like right. Right. there's a lot of money helping you. Um, right. Where like, you you know, you could write a book and put it out. Like, um, yeah. so there's that element too, where sometimes it kind of just feels like you're doing this for fun. Yeah, mm-hmm. that makes sense. Well, quick, I mean, just as timing has it, quick shout out to Robert Town, who actually passed away yesterday. Um, I know, I just saw that, yeah. Who the for the listeners who aren't familiar, he wrote Chinatown, which is considered yeah. one of the most iconic scripts in Hollywood. The best. Uh, for, the for best. A shampoo. Movie. He did yep. shampoo yeah. too. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So shout out to him. But um yeah, R. I. P. Really, it really is it really is an art form, as you say. It's 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 the structure is almost mathematical in terms of how you have to establish character, where your beats mm-hmm. are, how your kind of character and your story arcs play out and play off one another. It's uh it's it's quite a thing. I think anybody could write a basic screenplay, but very few people could write a brilliant, like Charlie Kaufman kind of screenplay that that's like, and I can't even do that. Like I'm not even close. I'm like a B plus screenwriter at this point. Well, that's on a different level. I mean, he's, he's a different level. of of Yeah. Yeah. But I, I feel like having, having done some screenwriting on spec, I feel like one of the things that helps me coming back to writing novels is that, the screenplay you don't have you have to convey a lot of um character or oh, sorry rather sorry a lot of story um kind of uh exposition in dialogue mm-hmm. because you yeah don't it's all have, dialogue you know mm-hmm. you can do some you, certain things you can do visually you can do with visual clues and setting and things like that but really what you're trying to do is you're trying to get as much backstory and exposition in the dialogue but at the same time um 
obscuring the fact that you're feeding the audience exposition. You know, that's it's yeah. like that, that sleight of hand. And I think that that mm -hmm. as a, if you bring that back to uh, fiction writing, that's a great exercise. It helps. That well, right. I saw an interview with um, Jake Gyllenhaal and he was mm -hmm. like, give me as much white on the page as possible. Mm -hmm. So like okay. when there's like a million description, you know, so it's a good way to kind of think of as you're writing. And I think for novel writing as well, like if I'm reading a very ultra literary novel and it's kind of just like all prose, yeah. <laughs> I get quite bored um, mm -hmm. and I want to get to the point. So I, I think every novelist, like try writing a screenplay, read at least like some of your favorite movies that are scripts yeah. and it'll only help your regular writing. Yeah, yeah, agreed. I would make the same suggestion for reading plays because I think that yeah. really oh, informed, yeah. you know, Greg and I were in theater school together mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we read so many plays and therefore have, I possess more plays than I think mm -hmm. any mm -hmm. one person should. and. I find it really helpful sometimes when I'm feeling a little stilted with dialogue and novel writing to like pick up, you know, something off the shelf. I mean, I have to be careful. It can't be too stylistic. Like don't pick up right. you know, UNESCO or, you know. Yeah, 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 it. yeah. You don't want to like, but. Mammoth's definitely his own, yeah. Yeah, yep. but there's some like wonderful, you know, contemporary playwrights that just do mm -hmm. dialogue so well and they um, really have perfected the art of mm -hmm. you know, communicating story through words. And, yep. you know, I think it's just a great way to practice writing characters as well. You know, yeah, because yeah. There's so much reliance on what they're saying. And then, of course, the actor imbues how they say it. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. You know, it, I think when you're first setting out to write a novel, you're probably very focused on like, OK, where's how's it going to end? Or, you know, what's yeah, what's the hook? Um, but I think the best novels have the characters moving the, the story forward. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all, it's all character. Like without, without that, there's nothing else. I, I find like going to see theater I'll, oftentimes really takes me out. I don't really get writer's block, but like if I feel it like in the distance kind of coming um, and, you know, being in New York, there's so much access to such amazing theater and I'll try to like pop into a matinee show. I don't know, once every like three weeks, every four weeks um, and just hearing the dialogue. It, it, it like really helps me. Like I just saw a stereophonic not too long ago. Um, this afternoon, I, funny enough. Oh, we're, we're dude, going, it's yeah. so, oh, it's so good. Okay. It's like three and a half hours, so just get ready. It's I've long. Heard that. I've heard that. Yeah, long. Like use the bathroom during the break. But like <laughs> the it's like a Robert Altman film. There's like right. so much dialogue happening, and you're kind of like paying attention to different things at the same time, and. It's just really, really excellent. Yeah, you'll 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 have a great time today. Okay, uh, that's exciting. Jealousy, jealousy yeah. over here. Well, so here's here's the question. In the last few minutes we have, because I'm trying to still figure out Lee where your imposter syndrome is. You know, you don't get writer's <laughs> block. You write across genres. Really yeah, you're doing screenplays, books. Like where? Yeah, does I'll, imposter syndrome I'll tell you my. Is? So my imposter syndrome is like industry based. Like I don't feel I'm at the place I want to be at in this industry. And I had a lot of indie books and while that's wonderful, like there's a limit to how much those have access to people. So my imposter syndrome always, and my whole career really has come from that. I just feel like I'm, I, I haven't made it enough in the industry. Um, and it definitely affects my writing because I'm pushing myself with each book for this to be the one to like break out on a different level. Um, so it's something I try to avoid, but it, like, it'll be there until it won't basically mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. you know, and until I hit, like I'll always, always have that. And I'm good at masking it, but like deep down inside, it keeps me up at night. Definitely. Yeah. Right. What, what are the kind of hallmarks of success in this industry from your point of view? You know, what would, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, I have a high bar, so, like, I, I want, yeah, like, a bestseller, like, you know, but even more than that, like, I would like, I had a book at a big five, and then I didn't, and I would like to be back at a big five, so, like, that would be a first success. I've had things optioned, and it hasn't gone through with 
ones connected to my scripts not so something that's actually greenlit that becomes something um you know really would be wonderful um but i think it's good i think it's good to have like goals and far reach goals as well you know like i said it it keeps me trying with each book for this book to be the one um and i wonder once when it happens um mm -hmm. if it'll also change my writing a little bit that like the hustle i would lose the hustle a little bit but i don't think so um but that's something that i also think about sometimes as well and you know it, for for people in the industry they know for people who aren't it, it's one of the most difficult industries to be in <laughs> like it is constant rejection all the time even for the top you know maybe not stephen king but like everybody else um and so to not feel imposter syndrome you know would be crazy and i think like i'm glad that it has never affected like a writer's block thing for me mm -hmm. at least yeah well well it sounds like almost uh the antithesis it sounds like you really are able to use that as the fuel to continue to keep striving for the kind of where you want to be and that fuels the work itself. So in a way you're really harnessing it kind of as well as it can be. It sounds like. Yeah, I'm pretty stubborn. So I think that mm -hmm. helps. Like I, I, and I don't take like no for an answer in terms of like what I want from a career. Um, so I think that's kind of kept me a little bit sane during it, everything, but I'm sure every author wants to be bigger than they are and, I, I can't imagine anybody's a hundred percent happy with where they're at, you know, nor should you be like, then you get complacent and your writing would be lazy. Right. Yeah. Our, uh, our reach should exceed our grasp, right? Always, always. I yeah. think, yeah, I think that's great advice for not just writing, but like life in general. Indeed. Indeed. That's a great yeah. note to leave off on. I love yes. that. Yeah. Lee, uh, thank you so much for coming. Oh, on. thank you. Yeah. This was wonderful. Hours. Yeah. Good. This was, it was like hanging out with two friends, just, yes. you know, gabbing about the industry. But yeah, no, this was fantastic. That's what and we're And this is for. what we want this podcast to be. So you have exactly. to come oh, back on. Excellent. Project. Oh, anytime. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. Yeah. Oh, and where can listeners find you? So my full name, LeeMatthewGoldberg.com, um, or I'm on Twitter at LMG Books, or Instagram and TikTok, Lee Matthew Goldberg. Amazing. All right. Lee Matthew Goldberg, you heard it from him. Thank you for coming on. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for sharing your time. Thank you. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you both. Oh, thank, thank you, you Lee. Imposter Hour with Liz and Greg is created and hosted by us, Elizabeth Keenan and Greg Wands. The show is produced and edited by Kate Herget, who started the Bookwild Collective with her podcast Between the Lines and her thriller podcast Killing the Tea. Our original theme music was composed by Scott Leeds and our logo was designed by Steve Loma. You can find us on IG at Imposter Hour Podcast and online at imposterhour.com. Thanks so much.